Welcome to the podcast, everyone. Uh, I am very excited for my guest today because I had a chance to work closely with him for a number of years, and he is awesome, uh, Mr. Stephen Torres. Uh, Stephen started with Cutco and Vector way back in 1992. Uh, he was a district manager in the Central Valley of California for a while, Stockton and Modesto. And after a number of years, Stephen had a chance to relocate to the Bay Area, where I got to work very closely with him for about six years. Uh, he was the assistant division manager in the Bay Area. He became the company's first Hall of Fame district manager, first district manager to achieve $10 million in career sales. He ultimately left the company to continue pursuing his education, graduated from UC Berkeley, held various roles uh, over several years, uh, went to Cornell for his MBA for a while, founded his own company and was the CEO uh, of another company for a while. And during that time, he became connected as a faculty member at UC Berkeley, has since been teaching uh, some of the most important and exclusive courses uh, at that uh, very fine institution. He has also uh, been coaching startup founders and offering his insights with the world. So, Stephen Torres, thanks so much for making time for the podcast. No, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, outstanding. Well, Stephen and I are a little juiced up on adrenaline right now yes. because uh, literally <laughs> a few minutes ago before we're recording this on a Sunday afternoon, uh, the San Francisco 49ers, who we both love, uh, took down a 48-46 <laughs> victory over the New Orleans Saints. So sorry to the you Saints fans that might be uh, <laughs> listening to the podcast today. Um, who dat, with chance of who dat, who dat, <laughs> dat be the number two best team in the NFC or maybe three. Um, <laughs> shoot, I'm going to have Seahawks fans breathing down my neck now since they beat the yeah. Niners. But uh, anyway, we're, we're all fired up and we're excited to have a, a great conversation today. So why don't we take it back to 1992, Stephen, and tell us yes. a little bit about uh, when you got started with Cutco. Yeah, that was an uh, interesting time. Uh, uh, I started as a Cutco sales rep with Jeff Lease in Fresno, California. Um, never forget that. Um, it was quite a ride because of everything that it turned into. Um, but I, I think the, the, the biggest thing was it, it was just a lot of fun to go out and do something. The way I got the job was my mom actually threatened me, said, Stephen, it, you either have to get a job or move out. Um, and so a few weeks later I told her I had a job, I'll be selling knives in people's homes. And, uh, she was like, okay. <laughs> so she responded with at least, uh, neutrality. Yes. Yeah. She, she <laughs> needed me to get a job. <laughs> That's pretty cool. And what were some of the early experiences you remember from getting started, uh, that first summer? You know, I, I mean, I think. The, the, some of the takeaways I, I, I remember and, and the things that were really impactful was just kind of learning how to sell was one. Um, and the other thing was the ability that you could actually create business. You know, for me, I've always wanted to, to be in business. So I, that was just something that I, I wanted to do as a kid growing up. And so to realize that you actually could go out there and make things happen. And then I think that was that the lesson was that not only that you you can make things happen, but you have to make things happen, mm -hmm. right? Like people don't just call you, you know, the phone's not ringing off your end, you know, hey, I want to buy knives. You have to actually go out there and make it happen and that you could do that, right? There is a system, there is a process that you could follow and it worked. So I think those are some of the early takeaways, uh, way back in the day. I, I love that you balanced that ability to make things happen with the idea that, well, that's what someone somewhere has to do for yes. an organization to be successful. And so we have that, that ability to create is also a responsibility to the, create. Absolutely. And it's a great insight for anyone, anywhere, wherever you're working is that somebody somewhere has to take the responsibility and initiative that, Hey, we're going to create something here. We're going to make something happen here versus being the followers um, and uh, and it's, it's cool that you gain that insight early on as a as a brand new Cutco rep. Yeah, that it's spot on because when you think about it, especially when you think about innovation, right? In innovation, everything that we see was created by people who had to imagine it first, and mm -hmm. they had to take the initiative to go and do it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in many of the cases, they didn't know how. 
right? The, the, the Wright brothers didn't have a pilot's license. You know, they, they just did it. They had to figure it out as they went. And, and so I think that there was a lot of corollaries. And that's why you see with Cutco folks, a lot of them become entrepreneurs is because you start to understand that it's your creation that goes out there and makes things happen. And that translates directly to pretty much anything else you do. Mm, that's a great insight. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that one for sure. So I know that you quickly advanced into management with the company and that you yeah. really struggled. You really struggled as a manager for quite some time. And then there was a particular transformational experience that happened <laughs> yeah. that turned your career around. So yes. tell, us, tell us about that. Yeah, well, uh, so I opened my office. I was 18 years old. So I was probably among some of the younger um, managers opening up at that time. And it, let's just say it didn't go well. Uh, I was uh, I was last um, in pretty much everything. In fact, I wasn't even on most of the rankings. The only way you could see what my office did was the blue reports. Um, and it didn't go well. Uh, the, the division manager at the time actually even um, said, hey, maybe I should close down the office. But a new division manager took over, Brad Britton. And uh, I, I'll never forget this because he gave me a call. And he, <laughs> he was trying to pump me up. And Brad's, he, he, Brad is great at this, right? So he, he's really casting the vision for where it's going to go and how we're going to do and we're going places. And, you know, he's like, Steven, you could be a part of it. And he said something that was meant to fire me up. It, I didn't take it that way. He's like, and Steven, you know, on this train that's going someplace, you know, you're like our caboose. You could be our caboose. <laughs> <laughs> and you know of course i'm like trying not to like be crushed which i was i was like oh my god i'm a caboose and you know for those of you who don't know what a caboose is the caboose is the last train on the car it never becomes the engine by the way it, it doesn't go up it always stays the caboose and so you know i had that reflection afterwards like oh my lord I'm a caboose. I can't go anywhere. I'm going to stuck. And, and like, it was, you know, I, I, I was struggling as a manager. And I, and I think at that time I, I didn't realize as a sales rep, you realize, you know, you have to go out and create things. Once I got into management, my, my mindset wasn't right. My mindset was that these people couldn't do it. And mm -hmm. it was like, like this fixed type of thing. And so I was crying on the floor. I'll never forget. I was in Stockton, California. I was laying there looking out. There was a, uh, apartment in the back of us. And I was like, what do I do? And um, as Jim wrote, would say, there's two things that drive you inspiration and desperation. And, and I was desperate. I didn't know what to do. And I was like, I need to talk to someone who's done this. And actually, this is where you came in. Uh, because I called you. And I, uh, you know, I asked, what do I do? How do I make this work? How do I get better? And you know, what you shared with me was, you know, you have to get better and you could learn there's these things out there. And that was kind of that transformational point to shifting from that fixed mindset to more of a growth mindset. Uh, you recommended it was Zig Ziglar. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that. And a couple of his cassette programs. And then after that, we got into Jim Rohn and, and, and so forth. But, but that was really the day that turned everything around because it, it lit the fire that, oh my God, I can learn. And if I learn, I can get better and everything else will change around me. Mm -hmm. Awesome. That, that uh, is a great insight. Now you, you talked about, you've referenced before with me that this concept of the fixed mindset and that yeah. you feel like it was something you sort of grew up with or around. Um, can yeah. you share a little bit about how that took hold for you? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I mean, I, I think that you know, I don't want to, uh, you know, place it directly on, you know, a specific location, but I, I think there's a couple of things that it comes from, right? Um, the, the fixed mindset is really the mindset that you're either good or you're not good, that you either have these inherent talents or you don't have them. And, you know, kind of where, where I grew up, there was a lot of this uh, fixed mindset, right? In, in the Central Valley, I think that there, there, there's actually, unfortunately, a lot of it that you're either good or you're bad. You're, it's kind of this dichotomy and, and you're either smart or you're dumb. I didn't, I didn't have great grades um, in growing up. Uh, I wasn't dumb, although 
uh, I do have an aunt that once said, um, oh, Stephen, we thought you were the dumb one. Uh, <laughs> <anyway. laughs> it's true, you know, and, and so I had that and that was, that was in my mind that, you know, I, I had succeeded as a sales rep. But that I felt was because I was a good salesperson. It wasn't that I learned all of these things and was applying them and working hard. I, I kind of didn't see that because of that fixed mindset. And then as, as I started learning is, is that growth mindset can take over. And the growth mindset is really just the belief that our minds are like plastic, not elastic. That once you stretch them and grow, they can continue growing. I mean, when you think about it between our ears, it's, you know, it's a bunch of chemicals and electric pulses. That's really what the brain is. And as you start creating and learning, you create more you know, pathways. You create uh, more uh, ability, if you will. And, and that was really, uh, I think, as I took on that, that growth mindset that, oh my gosh, I can learn this stuff. I can get better. And as I got better, all my circumstances, everything else got better. Mm, awesome. Awesome. So you, uh, you were in Stockton for a while. You went to Modesto. Yep. You began to have some better success. Um, but then uh, a real important time was when you ended up moving to the Bay Area. So tell us uh, you know, what went into moving to the Bay Area and, and what if you feel were some of your keys to success there where you became a Hall of Fame manager in the company? Sure. So um, so the move, it, it was funny, I, you know, Modesto was doing really well. We had just this development pipeline of branch managers who, who were kicking butt. And uh, I'll never forget the call, actually. It was Bruce. Bruce Goodman calls me up and he tells me, you know, hey, Steven, we have this opportunity. We'd love for you to go to the Bay Area. And at the time, I was not that excited, uh, frankly, because, you know, and maybe this was some of that fixed mindset, you know, fixed mindset never really goes away. We just have to learn to, to work with it and create the growth mindset. But um, I, I was reluctant because I had thought, you know, when I thought of the Bay Area, I thought of downtown San Francisco, a concrete jungle, no trees. And I was, you know, in Modesto by the mountains. Anyway, um, so Bruce, Bruce is kind of selling me uh, uh, on this. And he's like, have you ever been here? I was like, no, I haven't. He's like, well, you need to come out. You know, I, I live in the, the area. Check it out. It was to Walnut Creek. Um, and so I was like, okay, you know. I'm thinking, when do I really need to make this decision? You know, maybe I'll have a month or two and kind of fades out. So I asked Bruce on this phone call when he brings it up to me. He's like, Bruce, so how long do I have to decide? You know, when do you need, when do I need to let you know? And Bruce, as cool as a cucumber goes, oh, Stephen, I'll hold. (laughs) (laughs) That's when I knew I was coming to the Bay Area. (laughs) It's hilarious. That was um, cool. And so I uh, came out here and, and, and I think, you know, it was tough because I was letting go of the organization that I had. And, and it kind of gets to that thing. Sometimes you have to let go of who you are for the person you can become. Mm-hmm. And I think that was one of those transition periods where I came out here and there was already a, a, some folks uh, out here in the organization and they were just wonderful. Um, but then it was about how do you kind of take this stuff that you've learned and reapply it somewhere else because the environment is different, right? It, when you have a different environment, you have to learn how to operate within it uh, and how you specifically can can operate within that, that environment and around, um, you know, just a different mindset because it was different. There, there is a distinct difference between a central Valley mindset with the people who come in and, and, and kind of, uh, the Bay area or what I would call the Silicon Valley mindset. Um, and so it was really, uh, about having great people here and, and learning how to work with them. And I was very fortunate, right? I, I we would have, as you know, you get some of the most amazing uh, caliber people who have talent and skills and ability, but also they're open to growth and they're open to learning because they see it, right? They see people who've done it around the area that, that, that they live. And that has a huge impact. And I, and I think that impacted my ability to really develop the team. Um, yeah, that, that, that I think was the big key. Yeah, and you certainly attracted some amazing people, but you also played a big role in helping those people to develop. I think of, you know, Mike Schmid, uh, who's yeah. with the business today, Amanda Pereira, 
yeah. uh, Sean O'Keefe, Steven, yeah. Steve Soares. Like th- these yeah. are some great people you had um, that came into your office. But number one, you were able to attract them to want to be part of the team. And then number two, you were able to help them to develop and to grow and to become, you know, the best version of themselves. Yeah. You know? So what, what do you feel went into making you have so much success as a leader? Well, I, I think, you know, one of the things, you know, I, I remember Rich Plaskin actually at a meeting once uh, say something that was pretty profound. And it was that you'll, you'll never recruit anyone who's sharper than you. And that, you know, it, it kind of goes back to that growth mindset. And, and, and I think one of the biggest things as you do that, you, you work on your development, but you work on your development with the goal of how do you help everyone else and kind of the focus then comes off of you and onto these people, right? How do you help them develop? Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of that is, you know, you care a lot, like all of these people that you mentioned, I cared a lot that they were successful and that they did really, really well. Um, what's the saying, you know, people don't care how much, you know, till they know how much you care. I, I think that, that, that was a lot of it. Um, you know, I, I hope my people always got that sense that it, it was really about, them you know even even today as i teach it's it's really not about me it's off of self and onto this purpose of, of how do i help these people you know accomplish what they want to accomplish you know zig had you know in those tapes that i i read that you recommended had this amazing line that you can have everything in life you want if you help enough other people get what they want mm-hmm. right and and so that kind of service attitude or service servant leadership i think is a it was something that was cultivated um and then I just try to really play out. I mean, I wasn't always perfect. I mean, no one's perfect, but I think that was a really big focus. Yeah, that's a the the classic Zig Ziglarism yeah. that you shared right there. Like he <laughs> he more than anyone I can think of is associated with one specific quote uh, more than anybody else. That that, <laughs> that that saying that you can have everything you want if you help enough other people get what they want. And and it was great to kind of have a front row seat to seeing you doing that. Uh, you know, here in the Bay Area during your time as a district manager and as, as an assistant division manager. Um, so tell us uh, about your path after leaving Vector. Where, where did yeah. the path take you and how did it ultimately lead to you teaching classes at UC Berkeley? Sure. So um, right after Vector um, I in Berkeley, actually, I, I wanted to get into tech. That was like one of the areas that I felt, especially living here. And so I was recruited by this company at first called Success Factors. And I looked them up and they were just amazing. It was exactly what I wanted to do. They were a performance and talent management software as a service company based down in San Mateo area. And so I really wanted this job. I, I remember going in and uh, I interviewed, I thought it went well, like people were pretty receptive. I'm driving back home, I'm actually on the San Mateo Bridge and the recruiter calls, she's like, Steven, what did you do? <laughs> I was like, what? She's like, I think you are too enthusiastic. And I was like, oh my God. She's like, they're not gonna hire you. And I was shocked, I was like, no, I want this job. So I ended up reaching out to one of the folks who interviewed me and we went and grabbed coffee. Her name was Maureen Haskell, she was amazing. One of the best, business to business salespeople I've, I've ever met in my life. She was just phenomenal. And we just really struck up a conversation, um, connected a lot. And when another opening came around, she told me about it. I applied and I ended up uh, getting that job working at Success Factors. And I think that was really instrumental because it gave me, you know, working at Cutco is great because you understand a couple of things. You understand the, you know, business to consumer side, you understand the recruiting and the training and the development. And I think we've grown to over $600 million at my time while I was, was, was with the business. And then going to this, you know, super growth startup was really phenomenal. You know, you're, you're sitting there with all these great engineers and product marketing. And, and so it was just a, a really phenomenal time of, of learning and growth. And we ended up uh, doing well and going public and all those things. And um, after that, I got into clean tech for a while and eventually wanted to get my MBA, wanted to get an Ivy League MBA. And so I was able to go to Cornell. Um, at Cornell is actually where I started my business. Um, it was a, a new venture management class. And uh, it's one of those things, basically, you write a business plan and I pitched it and the folks that I pitched it to didn't like it. And as a matter of fact, they said the idea was stupid. 
Um, and the idea was a data analytics play for renewable energy. And it was, it, you know, basically I got a really bad grade on the idea, but my pitching skills were good. So, uh, but I was so mad that I started the business. <laughs> and <laughs> I was pissed, right? Didn't know how, didn't know what I was doing, but it, and it ended up working out. We got all these customers and sales and so forth. And, and then after business school, I was doing that. I was actually living in Manhattan and you know, the epicenter of solar was still back here in the Bay Area. So that brought me back here. Um, and as an undergrad, I took classes from what's called the Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology, which is now uh, the Sitarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. And one of my professors there asked me if I would come and give a kind of a, a sales and marketing communications talk to our engineers in a boot camp. And I did that. And thank goodness I uh, had given a talk here or there before in my past at Cutco and it, it went really well. And so he kept asking me back. And eventually, uh, after I was CEO at a, a company called My Domino, I, both of my companies that I started were acquired uh, by a really large clean tech investor. And then I was CEO for this person for one of his portfolio companies. And I was going back giving these talks and one of my old professors is the one who actually said, hey, you know, what are your plans? And I told him one day, I'd love to come back here and teach a class because there were classes that really inspired me. He's like, what would you want to teach? I was like, entrepreneurship and leadership. He's like, well, we have this class. Would you be interested? And I was like, yes. And so that's how I started teaching at Berkeley. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Now, I, I really want to get into your time teaching at Berkeley, um, yeah. but I would like to just back up for a second because you went through, so you, you worked at Success Factors for a while. Uh, they were purchased by SAP, right? Yeah, for a couple billion dollars. Were you there? Were you there during the IPO? No, I was there during the IPO. Yeah. So it was good. That was the first time I got to do all that and have the stock that pops and all those fun things. So yeah. I did buy my stock. So that was fun. <laughs> okay, good. Good for you. And then you got into clean tech for a while. You went yeah. to Cornell. Then you started, P, it was PV Solar Report. PV Solar Report was you first. Started. And then Sunnable. And then Sunnable was an out, offshoot out of that. It was actually one of my uh, colleagues from business school who joined me. He wanted to get into clean tech and he didn't know exactly how he was, wasn't able to get a job. And so he's like, hey, can I come work for you for free? I was like, sure. Um, and as we started working, what happened was we were getting a uh, customer call saying, Hey, you know, someone showed us this PV solar report. Um, and this was a consumer, not the actual, cause we were focused on the, uh, installation companies. Can you tell me who else in our area installs besides say solar city? Um, and we're like, well, yeah, let me tell you. And, and that kind of is what led us to build Sunnable, which was going to be like kind of kayak for, um, for solar installation companies. Uh, and, and I mean, there's so much, I mean, we could probably talk for hours about this, what I learned there, because as we were building this, we realized there was actually a bigger problem. And then we had to figure out how to solve that. And as we figured out how to solve that, we ended up getting uh, an offer to be acquired, which was another just kind of crazy thing. Like you, you just never expect that your company is going to get acquired so early. Mm hmm. What, were there some things that you learned from your vector management days that you feel helped you succeed in the business world? Oh my God. Um, like everything. I, I think the ability to sell and communicate, I, I think this is probably one of the most undervalued, underappreciated skills. Like if you listen to Ben Horowitz or you listen to some of these amazing tech people, they'll talk about it all the time is the ability to communicate, the ability to tell your story, to tell that narrative. Most people really lack that skill. And, and, and I, I see that a lot with startup founders, especially the, the technical ones they can build, but they can't communicate. And, and when I say communicate, I, I mean, not only, you know, just with your co-founder to build the product, but with customers, understand what they need, understand how you can build the product to, to product to solve a, a, a real problem. Because what we find is that most people fall in love with their solutions, not in love with the problem. And as you fall in love with your solution, you're not able to pivot and go down a path and explore things. And that's what good communication skills, that's what good selling and, and understanding kind of brought to the table. Um, you know, I, I'll say the other thing is 
understanding the financial signs. You got to make money. I was just last week talking to some founders and, you know, they have a consumer product, which is an amazing product. And I was like, what's the most important thing for you? And, you know, they, they said this, like, well, we just really want people to understand our vibe and our brand. And I was like, okay, no sales, right? Sales is what's important because if you communicate your vibe, sales will happen. And if the sales actually will tell a lot of the results now it's, it's different in different environments, you know, in some tech products and others, this is consumer product. And you just see that, that there's a lot of people that don't understand this, how important actually sales and revenue and generating business and, and traction and all these other things that kind of go into building a thriving, successful company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good insight for sure. I, I like that you uh, referenced the concept of storytelling yeah. um, and, and painting a vision for people. Uh, you mentioned Ben Horowitz for, you know, the, the uh, uh, listeners who aren't fully familiar with uh, the Silicon Valley and the scene here. Ben Horowitz is one of the founders of Andreessen Horowitz, which is one of the uh, most important venture capital firms uh, in the Silicon Valley and, and truly in the world. Um, Ben's CEO is Scott Cooper. Scott yeah. Scott is the managing partner at Andreessen Horowitz, and I know you know him, Stephen. And and he's yeah. a friend. He's actually a friend and neighbor of mine. Uh, lives literally on the same street. And um, Scott uh, talks about when they're evaluating a pitch from founders who are coming in. One of the things they really look at is the founder's storytelling ability, yeah. because as a founder you're going to have to be able to tell a story to get people to join your company, yep. right? To give up their jobs, to come to, you know, follow your vision and help you with your vision. Yeah. And you're going to have to be able to ultimately create a product and sell that product, right? And be able to, right. you know, teach people how to sell that product or, you know, impart upon others how to be able to do that, uh, develop people who can do that. And yeah. so storytelling being able to establish a vision, but then to be able to articulate that vision in a way that makes people want to follow is a critical piece of being a great leader for sure. Huge. Yeah. So just, uh, it was good to hear you reference that and that, that, that was a piece of what helped you to succeed. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so let's talk about what you're, what you are teaching to students today. Cause I know you've got some important ideas about what students need to learn to be great as entrepreneurs, to be great as leaders and storytelling, of course, is one of those things, but yeah. let's talk about some of the other things that you are other concepts that you share with your students. Yeah. So, so there's a lot. I, I mean, I think one of the things, you know, the growth mindset is certainly part of it and, and just understanding where success comes from. And, and what I say by that, you understand this. I, I think a lot of people don't understand that success actually comes from us. It comes from our mind. We have to imagine it. We have to see it. We have to, to kind of um, understand what goes into that. And, and some of that is desire, right? Weak desires typically is going to bring really weak results. And so one of the concepts I like to teach is this, this concept of the stick man. Um, it, it's an old concept from a guy named uh, Dr. Fleet. And it's, it's really the concept of behavior. And, and to simplify it, if you take a big circle and you cut it in half on the top half and then a bottom half, and then there's a little uh, neck and underneath his little body, the top half, think of that as your conscious mind. And that is your thinking mind. This is your logical side. On the bottom half is your subconscious mind. And this is uh, the feeling, the emotional side. And it's that, that combination, right, of the logical and the emotional that eventually drives your actions or your behaviors. And so those are your levers, right? If you have good thoughts, and they impress upon your subconscious mind, you get this feeling like, yeah, I could do it. You are more in, empowered to go and act. And that's what drives a lot of behavior. That action is your results. Mm -hmm. and, and so as you start to understand this, wow, what I'm thinking about, what comes into my mind changes the way that I feel. The way that I feel drives me. 
Now that can also be reverse engineered where if you go out and you run, that can change the way you feel, which can also adapt your thoughts. What most people don't get, and I think you get this, and, but what we think about is really what we become. And so most people get so stuck on, you know, one is they have this poverty consciousness or this, uh, I don't wanna say failure consciousness, instead of success consciousness or prosperity consciousness. And looking and finding the things that go into our minds that impress upon our subconscious, make us feel the right way to drive us to act. I think that's one of the concepts that, that we, we go through in our, you know, in my tech firm leadership skills and uh, some of the other things. I just finished a startup strategy class where we really were talking about, um, you know, these, these types of concepts. Mm, that 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 was uh, really insightful. There there was a uh, an interview I had on this podcast with Andrew Bosworth, who is uh, one of the top executives at Facebook now. Yeah, and um, he worked with us for two summers while he was in college at Harvard. And it was was Remember really Boz. In, yeah. What was really interesting? That's right. He was that was right during your years here. Um, his um, he had a really great insight that he shared, which was that that. As he was a Cutco rep, he had this awakening that he, what he called the one-to-one -one correlation between attitude and outcomes, and that a lot of people thought it was, well, outcomes drive attitude. It's, you know, if I have a big sale, then I feel great and I'm motivated and inspired, but that he realized unequivocally that it was the other way around, that it was attitude that drove outcomes. It was mindset that drove outcomes, and there certainly are so many key elements to that or pieces to that that we could talk about. Uh, but it's one of the, the things that people need to develop an awareness of and an understanding yeah. of is, is that success is driven largely from within first, right? And then it opens up the possibilities for the outer success to be achieved. Bingo. It, it, it goes back to that old, I say old book from the 30s, Think and Grow Rich, right? When, mm. you, when you really look at that, that was kind of one of the classic tropes that, that helped self-develop that and as a man think it. Um, but when you go to Think and Grow Rich, right, one of the most important chapters, in my opinion, I, I read that book all the time. I've read it I don't even know how many times now. In fact, uh, it's still here, right on my desk. Um, I just went through it with one of my mentors uh, recently. But the, the chapter on desire, right? And that you have to have a, 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 a burning desire to achieve. It's not a want, right? Want is not enough. A want, wants don't get answered. Everybody wants this, everybody wants this, but it's the people who really have this burning desire, whether it's sales, whether it's in a, as an entrepreneur, whether it's an engineer, it's those who really transmute that energy from burning desire into actions that end up with the achievements. And, and for me, that's understanding your, how your conscious thoughts influence your subconscious, which influences your emotions and gets you, you know, no one, um, it, it's really hard to emotionally get yourself out of a funk. You have to either act your way out of it or you have to get the right things to change the emotions. It, it doesn't happen any other way. And, and I think that's what Boz was talking about there, right? Yeah. That attitude, uh, that has to come first. Yeah, that was great. The, you know, this, this whole concept of wanting, versus a burning desire. Like everybody that I work with says they want stuff, yeah. right? But what happens is at some point you meet adversity. Yes. And when you meet adversity, that's where the, the, the people who are the real deal get yep. sorted out from the, ones, exactly right. from the ones that just have a want and don't have a burning desire. Because a burning desire plows through adversity. Absolutely. Right? Want gets beaten down and turned around That's by adversity. That's absolutely right. Yep. And you know, the, those, those folks that you, you see them all the time, if you look at great entrepreneurs, great VCs, you know, it doesn't matter what artists, uh, musicians, it's the ones that have and develop and cultivate that burning desire that really go out and, and have these achievements. Yeah, our, our friend Brett Barry uh, put it this way. He said, it's the difference between being interested and being committed. Yeah, right. that's a that, great uh, way to put it. Yeah, so 
Um, now, when you first had me come guest lecture in your class at Cal, uh, you said to me something like this. It was the idea that it was an engineering class, yep. right? Um, and it was called Technology Firm Leadership. And I still remember telling That's somebody, right. yeah, I'm speaking in a class called Technology Firm Leadership. And I'm like, I've never run a technology firm. <laughs> um, but, uh, but you said all these, techno all these uh, engineering students graduate with a great understanding of systems and structures and processes and yeah. all of the nuts and bolts of engineering. But what they need is the human side of leadership. That's right. And he said, that's what I want you to come and talk about. Yeah. So can you unpack that a little bit more for us? Yeah. So I, I think, you know, as you mentioned, especially, you know, and I'm sure at most other, you know, top engineering uh, programs, you have folks that really fundamentally understand the technology side. What they, they sometimes tend to miss because it's typically not part of the curriculum is that the technology piece is for the benefit of the human piece, mm. right? And it's that human piece, that, that, that humanness that connects us, right? If you look at technology companies that tend to be more successful than others, it's because they have this characteristic that they're able to bring together these, the, the, the human side of things. And so, here, what I, what I really wanted is how do we, one, make sure that people understand people are more important than just the tech, right? How do we communicate that, you know, if you lead people, they will build better tech things, right? That's really where that stemmed from and how it, how it came about, um, you know, is we don't in, in most, um, you know, engineering curriculums, they just don't have that human side of things. And, and so that's what I wanted to bring in. And, and I think along with that is the communication skills, right? For them to be able to just see how other people communicate because, you know, engineers are technically known for their great communication skills. Um, some of them are awkward, but they get exposed to it. And that kind of rubs off. It, it gets them to think consciously of, oh, here's how this person, maybe I could use some of that. And that comes into their subconscious, which then drives actions and of course, behaviors and results. Mm. That there was a, there was a lot in there uh, <laughs> that we could continue talking about and, and unpack a little bit. Um, you talked about the sort of the, the communication side for people who are uh, going to be, you know, founders, um, yes. right. And being able to just to be better at interacting with their people. Um, I know in, in coming to your class, one of the concepts I've shared is just the idea of, um, you know, how do you, how do you have a, a system where feedback can be uh, provided from both sides easily and comfortably? Right? How does the, how does the leader create an environment where people where people know that the leader is open to feedback? Right. Yeah. Hero, Hero Rodriguez talked about going to work with Keith Crock at DocuSign, and that you know Keith created that feeling that you know we need a direct, open, honest communication because we're trying to move fast here. We don't have time to dance around. Right. So we've yeah. got to be able to have good communication from both sides with openness. Yeah humility, right? That that's a real And no judgment. I think that's, that's one of the keys, right? Is there's no judgment that gets, you know, forecasty when someone comes to you. I, I don't remember what of my, one of my assistant managers once said, you know, Stephen, one of the things that I love working about you the most is that no matter what happens, even if we mess up, you always react the same. You're like, okay. You know, and, and I don't, you know, it didn't get too high. And, and that always stuck with me because it was that non-judgmental piece that allows people to bring you anything and to share anything. Um, mm. And I had to work on that because I'll tell you, as a young manager, especially at Cutco, if someone brought me something that was bad, I, you know, I just kind of went all off on it. And, and so I, I think that, you know, to, to, we're in, you know, now I think of, I'm in the business of helping people and not judging them. Right. And I think all leaders need to be in that realm where if someone brings you something, because that's how you get really authenticity 
and you get openness is there's no judgment when someone brings something to you. So you can really uh, get to the base of, of communication. Mm, outstanding. Well, one of my favorite maxims that relates to this is the idea that what's right is more important than who's right. Yeah. And, and I think great leaders are trying to get to the core of, you know, what is the right path versus always wanting to have the answers themselves and, and be right and sort of govern with an iron fist. And if you, especially if you're in an entrepreneur, uh, an innovation company, a tech company, um, that's one of the most important traits I feel to be able to have the flow of ideas that can move the organization forward quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, are there some interesting success stories from among the students you've had that you could share with us? Oh man, there's, there's so many. Um, you know, I think of one just off the top of my head is, uh, they were at the time when I saw them, they were sophomores and I was at a Berkeley angels event, uh, cause I do some angel investing and they gave up and they, let's just say that their pitch did not go very well. Um, it was, it was, it, yeah, it was not very well. In fact, when they left everybody, the angels always talk and they're like, Oh man, that was terrible. But what I saw in them was, I don't even know how to describe it. I'll just call it it. They had it. Hmm. And, you know, I started working and coaching with them. They go on to, um, you know, they raised a seed round of about 500 K. They went through some pivoting and the whole time, you know, I'm working and asking them questions and they're doing all the work. This is what I love about coaching. It just asking the really good questions of them so that they get the awareness themselves, because what I know is not important. It's really what they know and how they can apply it. Um, and so as they go down this, they end up raising a, a seed round of about 1.2 million earlier this year. Um, they've opened up now a couple locations. I think by the end of next year, we'll be at like nine locations or more. And, and actually this week, we're going to be working on their pitch deck uh, to raise uh, about a $10 million series A. They already have 2 million of it committed from previous investors. And, and so like when you see people like that, who have a burning desire to make a difference, who are coachable, right? And they're willing to learn and explore and they don't have to know how, right? They can figure out how to build this company as we go. Um, I think that's a, a really good example of, of someone who's kind of come through our programs. They're also our students. So they came to our classes and things. Um, but that, that's one that I really think about. Mm. And, and having that it factor, uh, again, such a critical piece. I come back to stuff I've learned listening to Scott Cooper. Um, and he talks about team being the first thing that they look at at Andreessen Horowitz, right? I mean, they assume if somebody's made it into Andreessen's offices that they've got, you know, the, the, they've got a big enough market and they've got a good enough product, but then why is this team particularly qualified? Yeah. And being able to demonstrate that through their charisma, through their energy, through their personal characteristics, uh, which comes back to that idea of growth, right? Ongoing yeah. growth and becoming more and becoming uh, more attractive to the marketplace and, and how valuable that is. So it's a good insight. Yeah. I think that's key. And it also goes with, you know, kind of the, law of rewards or the law of compensation. Like when you, when you look at, you know, a lot of times people ask me, especially students of, of you know, hey, how do I get a, a job that pays a lot, right? And it, it, that's not always the best way I think to look at it because the law of compensation is very clear and it, it's really simple. You're gonna be compensated amongst three things. One is the, the, the uh, uh, how would you put it? The, the demand for what you do Two, the ability for you to do it. And three, how easy it is to replace you, right? And, and if you understand those things, right, what is the demand for what I do, whether it's an engineer, whether it's an entrepreneur? And, and so in the case of investment, it's VCs are looking for people who are going to return asymmetrical returns. And so the demand for someone who can do that is very, very high. And then two, the ability for them to do it. Can they actually deliver? Can they go through and, and actually execute? And then how hard is it to replace them? Is, is two days from now, someone else going to walk in working on the same idea that's actually a better team, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and so it kind of complies to that, the, the law of, of compensation. And that works whether you're an entrepreneur that works whether you're a software engineer. It works whether you're, you know, a 
toilet cleaner and it, it, it doesn't matter. The laws of compensation are very, very clear. Mm. Wow. That was a really, really great point. Uh, awesome insight. The law of compensation. So uh, Stephen, now you are, uh, you're teaching your classes at Cal. You are coaching yep. startup founders and doing some consulting. You're doing some yep. speaking uh, really all over the world. Yep. As you look into your future, five years, 10 years down the road, uh, how do you aspire to change people's lives through your work or through your influence? Yeah, you know, I, I think a lot of it is just really bringing this awareness to people that they can do it and, and it's up to them. Um, <clears throat> you know, I think I had mentioned before uh, that when I go and teach, one of the things, especially if I'm teaching executives, uh, recently I was down in Brazil teaching a, a, a group of executives and there's a group of the Netherlands that, that I was teaching. Uh, one of the things I always talk about is that everything comes down to BS, right? And when I do this, I have on the, the slide behind me is a big old picture of a cow patty or a cow pie if you know what that is it's cow dung <laughs> uh, i don't know we're you know, pg here a um, turd <laughs> yeah basically and i'm talking about everything is bs your education bs you know your career bs your success it's all based on bs and i say what am i talking about and you know everybody's like bullshit I'm like, no belief system right it's really about someone's belief system and that belief system that we have is programmed by a couple of things, right? It's programmed, well, one is our genes. There are certain characteristics that we have. But the other is our environment. And then the third is our role models, right? And so your belief system is always going to be coming from those things, right? Your environment and your role models will change that. And when things come to you, you have three options. You can either accept it, reject it, or neglect it. And that's what happens as people start to learn things. And, and the people who tend to be more successful, they, they really understand. So they put themselves in environments that are conducive to success. They find mm -hmm. role models who are successful. You know, you can't, to be healthy, I don't know if it's always the best thing to study disease because disease and health aren't the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Studying failures, while it can be helpful, I don't know if that's as helpful as studying someone who's really successful, mm -hmm. right? Because you start to take on that belief system that these other people have. And so that's really what I want to do is, is help people bring into their awareness that they need to be conscious of their environment. They need to be conscious of their role models because that's what's going into our minds. That's what's creating the operating system, if you will, of our lives. Wow. Well, that was a uh, fantastic concept uh, for us to wrap up on right there, Stephen. I think that's an amazing insight for people is to really think about what is going into their minds. The idea, the awareness that success begins in the mind is a great concept you've shared throughout this conversation, uh, helping people to understand the development of their belief systems and the importance of their environment, their role models. Uh, it's clear that the people that get to be around you are getting exposed to some amazing ideas. I think your students are very lucky to be able to have you teaching there at, uh, at Cal. And, uh, and for all the uh, young entrepreneurs or startup founders that you get to coach, uh, they're getting some insights that can make a real difference that, that, that's a little bit different than what they might get from uh, a lot of other coaches, and, and it's great to know that uh, a piece of the knowledge you've gained has come through your time with Cutco and Vector, so I'm really grateful oh, yeah. for that, and just uh, really want to thank you for your time here on the podcast today. I appreciate it, and uh, feel free to anyone connect with me. I'm on LinkedIn, Stephen D. Torres. Uh, Twitter is Toro, Toro Stephen. I couldn't remember my Twitter handle. Uh, uh, you know, I'm also, if, you, if they know you, you could probably connect with me on Facebook, but I'm set to private to only friends of friends. Uh, but there you go. All right. I invite you guys to connect with Stephen Torres. Stephen is with a PH and Torres is T-O-R-R-E-S. Thanks again, Stephen. This has been great. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Bye-bye. How about that, everyone? Stephen Torres. Uh, boy, I hope you enjoyed that one as much as I did. Uh, loved uh, Stephen talking about the ability to create that he learned as a Cutco sales rep. 
that we have that ability to, to create something where there was nothing. Uh, and that's what entrepreneurs do. That's what founders of companies do ultimately is they create something where there was nothing. And, and as a salesperson, you have a chance to learn and develop that skill. The importance of the growth mindset versus the fixed mindset. And Steven said, you know, sometimes you have to let go of who you are for the person you can become. And that through growing himself and focusing on his own personal growth, he became more attractive uh, within our company. And he began attracting better people to his team and developing a better and better team, a more successful team. Um, he described during his time after Cutco uh, the importance of the ability to sell and communicate, uh, the importance of storytelling, painting a vision for people, and, and why that was so important. And then, of course, I love when he's talking about what he teaches to students today, the concept that success comes from within, how mindset drives behavior. Very important insight uh, that I know many people have heard, but uh, worth hearing again today and worth considering how that applies in your own life. What are the elements of your mindset that are serving you to this day? And what are some of the elements of your mindset that may be holding you back? What are some of your limiting beliefs? Uh, there was a point where Stephen talked about how the tech side of developing a company is for the benefit of the human side. And the idea that people are more important than the tech. Um, and, and I just think as, as leaders, when, we're, when, we, when, we, when we make a sale in a Cutco organization, um, it's a customer, it's a person purchasing that. It's not a credit card purchasing that. It's a person who purchases that. And the human side of that interaction is critical. That also translates to leadership. When a company is built to become great, you know, it's not human resources. It's not the resources part of human resources, right? That creates that result. It's the human part. I, I just feel like when I think of human resources, I feel like it is, it is undervaluing the role that individual people play in building any organization, any team, right? It's humans, right? That build success in an organization. And, uh, and as we can learn to treat people really well in an organization as leaders, uh, that's one of the things that helps build a great team, uh, build a great organization. Um, I enjoyed Stephen's final comments about the concept of BS, meaning belief systems, and how they are partially developed by our genes and you know where we came from. But the environment that we are in, that we are putting ourselves in, is a big part of that. And having role models that we can follow and study, and the important value of studying success. Uh, again, hope you really enjoyed that. Uh, if you're listening to this anywhere near the release date, it's the holiday season, and I wish you a happy and safe holiday season. Regardless of when you're listening to this, I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day.